Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining me today. Uh, let's begin with the prayer, a prayer I always use uh, before I speak. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Brothers and sisters, my name is Lewis Brown. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's a blessing to be with you uh, and speak with you today about Christian identity in a world in chaos. I am a Catholic man, an attorney by trade, uh, who has the uh, blessing of leading the Christ Medicus Foundation. It's a Catholic healthcare nonprofit dedicated to sharing the love of God in healthcare by protecting the right of conscience and religious freedom in healthcare and advancing authentically Christ-centered medical care to particularly serve uh, those who are most vulnerable in our country. I'm here to speak with you today about God's call to live in Christian identity in a world of seeming chaos. So much of what we assumed would always be around, what, so much of what we assumed was secure seems to be collapsing. We see grave challenges within the church, within our Catholic church. We see grave challenges within our country. We see grave challenges to the defense of the unborn, to religious freedom, to human dignity, and to a fundamental understanding of the human person. As scripture tells us truly, everything is passing away. More than any time in our lives, it seems like the foundation of many things are disintegrating. Yet the incredible news, the incredible news, the news of eternal hope is that in all of this, one thing remains, the love of Jesus Christ poured out for all humanity through the Holy Spirit in the Holy Catholic Church. In all the chaos, in all the chaos around us, we, my brothers and sisters, have one priority. The priority is to remember, to remember who we are. We must remember who made us and we must remember where we are going. As baptized Christians, we are sons and daughters of God. We are made in God's image and likeness. We are made for eternity with God. If we persevere in choosing him, we will see that eternity. We are heirs to an eternal kingdom of love that is not of this world. We are his. We are his. Before we are a son or daughter, before we are a brother or a sister, before we are husbands and wives from this family or that family, before we are doctors, homemakers, business executives, lawyers, teachers, construction workers, waitresses, tradesmen, or persons looking for work, unemployed, before we are Republicans or Democrats, before even our racial identity, before we are proud Americans, we, my brothers and sisters, are children of God, friends of the Lord Jesus Christ, and warriors for the most powerful force in human history, the love of God. We are Catholics on mission to be heralds of God's love for every person on the face of the planet. In this time in America as Catholics, members of the universal church founded by Jesus Christ, we must remember who we are. We must remember who we are. We are Catholic, and we have been sent to bring God's love to every person on the face of the earth. Now, let us consider our Christian identity and how that identity comes under attack. In all that we do as Christians, we must operate out of our identity as children of God, made to love God and to love our neighbors, no matter what may come. This is not an option. It is an obligation. While the demand to love every single person we encounter may seem impossible. With God's grace, we know all things are possible. All things are possible. God calls us to love. This is not the empty love of the world that is sentimental, emotional, and often lacking in truth. God calls us to a true lasting love of every person, a love which is sacrificial, a love which is both tender and fierce, and a love based on objective truth, a love that extends even to our enemies. 
God calls us to give up our very lives, even for those who may hate us, just as Christ did on the cross. God calls us to a love that is ultimately joyful and absolutely liberating. To paraphrase John Paul II, the more we discover this love of God, the more we discover this love of God, the more we find ourselves. Tragically, however, tragically, despite this incredible identity that we have been bestowed on, uh, on upon us from the Lord through our baptism, tragically, the world, the flesh, and the devil tempt to reject the to tempt us to reject this identity, to forget who we are, or even to oppose the truth of who we are and the truth of who others are and the truth of who God is. Our own hearts, our own hearts my brothers and sisters, so weighed down by our own sin, by our own shame, wounds, grief, loss, trauma, fear, disappointment, and anger. Our own hearts can tempt us to a self-hatred, to a self-condemnation. Our pride can tempt us to hate our neighbor, despite the fact that we are called to hate sin, but to always, always, always love the sinner. Our own self-righteousness, our laziness, a lack of self-reflection, these things can also cause us to forget our identity, can cause many of us to spend more time accusing others of their own sins. Horrible as those sins may be, and as much as they may be corrected, we can spend often, because of our self-righteousness, that laziness, that lack of self-reflection, we can spend more time accusing others than we do of repenting of our own sins and converting. Our identities come under attack also through our own family members and through our community. We may experience family members, friends, colleagues through their sin, their woundedness. And when their words may place us in a box, they may reduce us. And this happens perhaps to all of us every day. They may reduce us to something less than the children of God we are. And that too attacks our identity. Our country's political divisions, these as well attack our identity as sons and daughters of God. Our country's political process, vitally as important as this process is, can tempt us to live first as conservatives or liberals, as Republicans or Democrats, instead of simply Catholics. Yes, certain political perspectives are much more consistent with the fundamental truths of the moral law and of the human person than other political perspectives. The church through the chair of Peter has repeatedly condemned communism, socialism, racist ideologies, and atheistic secularization. The church has condemned all of these things. However, that's not the point of this talk. The point of this talk is that, as you probably know, in this hyper-politicized political environment, Pop of the popular culture of our times, we forget, we forget, and I'm guilty of this at times, we forget that we are called to live first and last as Christians, that it should be our Catholic faith first and last that drives our political activity. Our country's media, in addition to our political culture, is also attacking our identity. They are so, so much of our media is so lacking the fundamental truths of human existence and of human dignity, that so much of our media may tempt us to panic, to fear, or even to a hatred of those who disagree with us. Most importantly, within all of these attacks that may come from our own hearts, that may come from our communities, that may come from our own sin and shame, that may come from the media, that may come from our popular culture. So hyper-politicized, upon all, above all else, with all of these attacks in our identity that we often experience and probably experience in some form or fashion every day, the, the most perhaps serious attack is the one that directly comes from the evil one, who's constantly seeking to undermine and destroy our identity, just as he attempted to destroy the identity of Christ in the desert. 
The evil one tempts us to lies about who God is, to lies about who we are in God, to lies about God's plan for us. Identifying these attacks, these various attacks that come from both the world, the flesh, and as well as the devil, identifying these attacks on our identity is not for the purpose of allowing us to have a pity party. You know, it's not, it's not for that purpose. The purpose of identifying these attacks is to help us to know what's going on, what's coming against us, and to help us to keep rooted in the heart of God as his sons and daughters. How do these attacks on our identity play out? What happens when we are accept our identity in Christ and reject these attacks? And then what happens when we actually fail to reject those, those attacks? What happens? We see these questions played out powerfully in the 2019 film, A Hidden Life. This Terrence Malick film is a true story about the life of Franz Jagerstad, Jagerstadter, a farmer in rural Austria in the 1930s and 40s who was devoted to God, to family, his community, and his country in that order. When drafted into the Nazi-controlled Austrian army, Jagerstadter becomes a conscientious objector. He stands out as a sign of contradiction contrary to so many others of this time who are indifferent or deceived or paralyzed by fear or so intimidated by the spirit of the age that they simply conformed, they simply gave in, looked the other way, or even, God forbid, gave their hearts over and actively actively collaborated with the evils of the day. In a chilling moment in the film, a hidden life, in the chilling moment in this film, Blessed Jager Stadter remarks that his countrymen, his fellow townspeople, all of whom are Christian, most likely, and almost certainly the majority of whom are Catholic, in the midst of the cataclysm of the times, Blessed Jager Stadter remarks that those townspeople had forgotten who they were. Similar to the loss of the true identity of many of the townspeople, in the film, A Hidden Life, we see a similar tragedy, a similar tragedy in the loss of, true, of the true identity that so many of us experience. And we see a similar story, uh, this one uh, told by J.R.R. Tolkien through the Lord of the Rings trilogy and uh, done well, uh, articulated well, uh, shown well in the film. Uh, the trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, that came out uh, in the 2000s. And particularly, we see this in the identity of Smeagol, who ultimately becomes Gollum. Gollum is this creature who once was a hobbit, who becomes so obsessed with the ring of power, so consumed by the darkness, that his mind is darkened to the truth, that he forgets his true identity, that he forgets where he came from, and he forgets his own name. It's amazingly well depicted in the film. Unlike the character, unlike the character of Gollum, the real life blessed Franz Jager's daughter remembered his Catholic identity. Blessed, Fr blessed Franz Jager's daughter rejected the spirit of the age. He rejected the temptation to give in to the moral demands of the prevailing culture. He rejected the tyranny of conformity to evil that would have destroyed his true Catholic identity. He eventually persevered in love for Jesus Christ, and he eventually kept his Christian identity. He eventually refused to fight in the Nazi-controlled Austrian army and was executed, losing his life in martyrdom. Yet he tasted life eternal with our Lord because of that decision, because of that choice. Blessed Franz Jagerstadter loved God, and he lo loved his fellow man too much to save his own life but lose his soul. How did Blessed Jagerstadter persevere as a Catholic to the end? How do we persevere to ca as Catholics to the end in our own time? Like, like Jagerstadter and every saint throughout the ages, in a world of such confusion, our spiritual survival depends our, on daily wandering into the heart of God, daily spending time with him, giving God the freedom to heal our wounds through the sacraments and through the power and through the power of the Holy Spirit. It depends 
on giving our Lord permission to bestow on us every day our eternal identity as his created children made to be instruments of his love. In other words, the Christian today must go before our Lord to be daily reminded of who he or she is. We need a daily encounter with the person of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. We need mass daily if possible. We need frequent confession and frequent adoration. We need spiritual reading. We need to study the catechism, which I need to do. <laughs> and we need to read the prophetic voices of the church, such as St. John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, Venerable Fulton Sheen, Cardinal Robert Seurat, Archbishop Charles Chaput, and Cardinal Gerhard Mueller. We also need Christ-centered community in which friends and family truly accompany each other in intimacy and in the triumph, joys, and hardships of life. If we do not know who we are through all of this, through the sacraments, through community, through spiritual reading, through prayer, through spending time with God, if we do not know who we are, we will not know how to act, particularly in this time. If we know who we are in God, all things are possible. As St. John Paul II proclaimed, we are the sum, totals, sum total of the Father's love for us. We have everything in God who is love, truth, and beauty itself. We act out of an abundance of his grace, which is infinite. We have everything in God. We are made to govern. We are made by God to govern this world in love, justice, truth, freedom, beauty, and goodness. If we do not know who we are, we do not know how to act. But once we find who we are through God, again, all things are possible. One year ago, at the Seek 2020 conference, Cardinal Mueller preached that we are called to choose the spirit of God over the spirit of the age. We are called to accept our identity as sons and daughters of God. We are called to expect our Lord to buy, to provide everything we truly need, which is his love. We are called to grow deeper in the reality of his personal specific love for us and to grow deeper in the trust and the expectation of his provision. We are called to remember that the only thing we need is his love. And knowing that all we need is his love, we are liberated from the false idols of money, power, career, sex, prestige, status, relationships, things that may be good in and of themselves, but which are less than the total fulfilling love of God. If we accept his love and his healing power over us, we become who we truly are, and we go forth in the power of his love to share the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. In sharing the kingdom of God, which is the love of God for his people, we reject the false claims on our identity. We reject shame and self-condemnation. We reject the false identities that would steal our spiritual heritage. We reject the temptation to conform with the evil of the age. We reject the temptation to hatred and contempt for those who disagree with us. We reject paralyzing fear, which is incompatible with faith in Christ. We reject seeking solely political solutions to problems which ultimately require spiritual solutions, namely evangelization and Christian revival. We reject ends justify the means thinking. This takes me to the reality of this moment in history. While we grow deeper in identity, while we accept the love of God, while we accept the identity with which God made us and reject the false self, reject the spirit of the age, but embrace the spirit of God, we must understand the, re the reality of the moment in which we live. This moment that that we are living in these historic times, it has been foretold. Our Blessed Mother told us about this time over 100 years ago at Fatima and over and over again in numerous approved, church approved apparitions. St. John Paul II told us throughout his pontificate 
Venerable Fulton Sheen warned us throughout his ministry. What did they warn us about? What did they tell us? They foretold with their prophetic voices that much of the world will want to deny God and exalt man in God's place. It's the same sin of the fall. They foretold that much of the world would want to crown man as king instead of God. They foretold that much of the world would want to destroy the truth of the gospel and the beauty of the human person. They foretold that much of the world would want to attack and break down the family. They foretold that much of the world wants to place true freedom, wants to replace true freedom with license. They foretold that much of the world would want to call good evil and evil good. They foretold that much of the world would want to call call lies truth and truth lies. Sadly, today, much of the world seeks a culture of death and despair, of abortion, family breakdown, suicide, and addiction, a culture of license and enslavement to one's empty passions, instead of a culture of life, instead of a cult culture of sacrificial love, instead of a culture of truth and joy and justice. Much of the world wants to spread the errors of communism and socialism and atheistic secularism to create a human community, to create a human community in which man and the state are God and in which God is totally removed from human society. St. John Paul II told us that we are in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel of life and the culture of death. In addition to St. John Paul II, over 50 years ago, in a homily for the 50th anniversary of the Diocese of Raleigh, you can watch it on YouTube, I highly encourage you to do so. Venerable Fulton Sheen told, told that crowd gathered in Raleigh, North Carolina, and told, tells us even today that Christendom has died. Christendom has died, not the church. As he said, paraphrasing him, Christendom has died, not the church. Venerable Fulton Sheen taught us that the prevailing culture in the West that had lasted for, for over 1,500 years, the prevailing culture in the West, which was Christendom, that was largely built on the gospel and the true moral law, had died. That Christendom has died. But he encouraged us, despite the collapse of Christendom, despite that fact that's uh, that he saw in the 70s and that's ever more clear now, despite that collapse of Christendom, we know that the church, the mystical body of Christ, will always, will always rise, will always be ever present. And Venerable Fulton Sheen encouraged us to not be afraid he encouraged us to know that we are made for this time. He encouraged us to know that these are glorious times in which the loving, merciful, and healing power of God will triumph in ways beyond our wildest dreams. Our Blessed Mother's Immaculate Heart will triumph no matter what. The love of God will triumph no matter what may come. We are on a wild ride. We can all feel that, I imagine now. But the glory, the joy, and the peace of God and his holiness available to us now and every day is with us. In every moment in history, and especially today, the Holy Spirit calls us to have an integrated Catholic witness, even in the cataclysm of these times, to think with the mind of Christ, to just be Catholic, to have a truly Christian worldview. Even in the chaos of today, love is the only answer. Love is the only weapon. Our worldview, our identity is based on the highest Christian obligation and the greatest truth and the greatest desire of the human heart. What uh, one of my favorites, Ralph Martin called fulfillment of all desire, the love of God and the love of God for every human being, the love of God for us, 
and the love of God for every human being. This love for God and love for neighbor is the highest Christian obligation. It is from it is from our knowledge of God's love for us and out of knowledge of his love for his creation that we form our Christian worldview, that we form our identity and that we go out. It is from this Christian worldview that we as Christians, even in the cataclysm of our times, even in the chaos of today, it is in this worldview, in this identity, in this Christian identity that we go out that we defend the dignity of all people, especially the vulnerable, the, the unborn, the unborn child, the most vulnerable, who must be protected and who are deserving to be the preeminent priority of our political and popular culture to protect the unborn and defend their dignity. That's what we do. And in doing so, while we defend the dignity of the unborn, we also defend the dignity of the immigrant, the dignity of the person in poverty, the dignity of all persons who are in poverty, the dignity of all persons who are disabled, the dignity of the aged, the elderly. In this Christian identity, with this Christian worldview, we seek divine justice in which each person is owed love. We seek the truth of things, applying faith and reason together, which mutually reinforce each other. We as Christians, as Catholics, seek a rule of law and a just society in which in which every, every person, every person's dignity and every person's God given rights are equally protected and respected. We as Catholics seek to care for the sick, to be in solidarity to literally suffer with the suffering, especially in times of public health care crisis. This is much of the mission of the Christ Medicus Foundation that I'm blessed to lead. We as Catholics seek healing between our brothers and sisters of every race and language. We seek a healing rooted in the truth of the human person and the truth of human existence. We as Catholics always, always seek the common good, to share eternal life with each person we encounter, both in our private sphere and in the public sphere. And even when some within the world would hate us, we strongly return our love for them, a love built on the eternal foundation of truth. Even when some within the world hate us, we offer them the very truth that their own hearts truly seek. This is who we are. This is how God created us. This is our Catholic identity. This is our Christian worldview. In a world that's seemingly falling apart, our Lord's healing love and mercy gives us the eyes to see our true identity as his beloved children and to share the promise of that identity with all his people. And so going forward, I challenge you, I challenge you to do three things. I challenge you first to pray an hour a day. And this is something that I myself need to work on. I first challenge you to first to pray an hour a day, including a daily rosary, uh, including uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and particularly including mental prayer, perhaps 15 minutes of mental prayer. So I challenge you, pray one hour a day. Pray one hour a day, and I challenge myself, number one. Number two, in terms of forming our mind and the truth of things, I really encourage all of you watching this talk to read Cardinal Robert Seurat's uh, 2019 book, The Day Is Now Far Spent. Uh, amazing, incredible, providential that that book came out a year bef before, the, uh, before 2020 and everything that happened in 2020. Um, but I highly encourage you, number two, to read Cardinal Seurat's book, The Day Is Now Far Spent. It's a stunning uh, revelation uh, of a book. Number three, I encourage you to educate yourselves on forming, forming and, and maintaining your formation, the formation of your mind on a Christian worldview, on human dignity, on the right of conscience and religious freedom and healthcare, 
and on the and on the ongoing public health care crisis um, by going to Christ Medicus Foundation um, and uh, helping us uh, help you stay informed. Um, we're going through an incredible time with so much going on uh, in healthcare, and it's affecting all of us every single day. Uh, and it is a gift through the Christ Medicus Foundation to really seek to apply the gospel, to apply church teaching to uh, the public health care crisis we, we are in, to understand how to protect uh, human life, to protect human dignity, to protect religious freedom, to protect civil rights, uh, and to advance public health. Uh, and while all the while maintaining our religious freedom. Um, and we encourage you to take advantage of the work that our Lord uh, is doing through us and through the Christ Medicus Foundation right now. That's, you can go to uh, ChristMedicus.org. It's C-H-R-I-S-T-M-E-D-I-C-U-S.org. So number one, I encourage you to pray an hour a day, particularly the Rosary, Mental Prayer, Divine Mercy Chaplet. Number two, I encourage you to read Cardinal Robert Seurat's book, The Day Is Now Far Spent. Number three, I encourage you to form yourselves on the truth of human dignity, the truth of uh, protecting the right to life, the truth of protecting religious freedom and healthcare, and going to the Christ Medicus Foundation uh, website at ChristMedicus.org. Finally, I want to encourage you to be not afraid. Be not afraid, be encouraged by the witnesses of the saints before us. According to a Vatican biography online, which you can, you can uh, go and read for yourselves, Blessed Franz Jagerstadter wrote the following just before his martyrdom. And it, it, it quotes from different passages within uh, this writing of Blessed Franz Jagerstadter, and I quote, he said, if I must write with my hands in chains, I find that much better than if my will, than if my will were in chains. Neither prison nor chains nor sentence of death can rob a man of his faith and his free will. God gives so much strength that it is possible to bear any suffering. God gives so much strength that it is possible to bear any suffering. He continued, people worry about the obligations of conscience as they concern my wife and children. And he said, quote, but I cannot believe that just because one as a wife and children, a man is free to offend God. And so let us see right now, let us see, let us see in our mind's eye, let us see with the mind of Christ, like blessed Franz Jäger Stotter did, even in the most difficult circumstances. Let us take courage and be not afraid like St. John Paul II always encouraged us to do. And let us go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us go forward on mission, knowing that our Father God loves us, knowing that his love frees us to be who we truly are and gives us all we need for our identity. And knowing that his love, God's love, is the only firm foundation for ourselves, for our families, for our nation, and for the world. May God bless you. May God surround you with his protection. And may God seal you in his precious blood. And may you go forward in the power of the Holy Spirit for the remainder of 2021 and for the rest of your lives. May God bless you and thank you for joining.